Now let us look at a, a slightly different example. Suppose uh, there is one cake and uh, there are two kids and their mother wants to divide the cake in such a way that both these uh, individuals, both these uh, kids are uh, happy with his or her portion. Uh, what do we mean by happy? That they do not envy each other. Uh, so one way of uh, defining that is that um, after the division is done, kid one will think uh, they got at least half um, of, uh, of this cake and the other uh, uh, player, uh, other kid will also think that she also got at least half of that cake. I would like to emphasize that, that uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, view that they get, that they are getting half of that yeah, is, is according to their own view. And uh, the, uh, the mother does not know, uh, nobody essentially knows. Uh, what they actually like. So maybe some of them like the cherry on top, uh, some of them like the, uh, uh, the chocolate part more uh, than the other parts and this is uh, completely unknown. If the, if the mother uh, knew everything, uh, every uh, uh, choice or every uh, preference of these uh, individuals, then she could have actually made the division herself and given the pieces to them. Now, uh, this uh, at least half, as we as we have mentioned, this uh, notion is uh, subjective, and this is also a, a private information of each of these uh, kids. Now, if uh, without this information, if the mother cuts this cake and gives uh, the pieces each uh, to each of this uh, uh, child, then there could be a possibility that uh, one uh, child will say that the the piece of the other child is uh, actually larger. And that will create a situation of an envy. Now, how, the the question that we are going to ask in this context is: How can you uh, make, or can you at all make uh, this kind of a division to be envy-free, so that nobody essentially uh, envies each other's pieces? Now, this is a, a, a kind of a classical problem, a very age-old problem, and therefore it also has an age-old solution. Um, so how, how does it uh, do? Uh, before that, let's uh, uh, list down the challenges. So the mother wants to achieve what we will call a fair division. Fair as in envy free. And, uh, but it does not have, uh, the mother does not uh, have enough information to do that fair division. Uh, in other words, it does not even know that uh, what is a fair division. So how can, you, how can you still do a fair division without knowing this information? Uh, so this is uh, naturally bringing us to the situation of mechanism design. Can she design a mechanism that uh, with this incomplete information they can, uh, the, uh, the mother can achieve a fair division? And um, uh, people who had uh, uh, siblings might have uh, uh, come across this situation uh, uh, very often and uh, here is one solution one very interesting and uh, uh, quite uh, uh, well-known solution. Let us call this uh, mechanism, uh, I cut, you choose mechanism. So what, uh, what the mother says is that uh, it identifies one of these kids, let's say kid one, to cut the cake, but kid two to choose, the, uh, uh, choose her favorite piece. So it will not allow the, the, uh, the person who is cutting the cake to, uh, to pick the first piece. The, the remaining piece will be picked by kid one. This is the I cut, you choose mechanism. So let us uh, try to understand why this mechanism works. So uh, the, the first thing is that you would uh, you'd see that uh, kid one, when this mechanism is, uh, is designed and the rules are told to these kids, it will, uh, the kid one will know that it will get the, the second piece uh, after kid two has picked uh, her, her piece. So kid one will try to make the division as equal as possible in his view, right? So his view, view might be different from the other kid's view, but uh, he will divide it exactly in half according to his view so that he is indifferent between these two things. 
because he knows that if he cuts it uh, unequally, the other kid might pick uh, the bigger piece and he will be envious. So he will do it, do it in exactly the halfway uh, and he will be happy with any of the pieces that he gets. Kid 2 will also be happy because he got exactly the, the first piece to pick. I mean, if in his view, uh, in Kid 2's view, uh, one of the pieces were larger, then she gets to pick that larger one. Uh, and uh, she will not be envying the, the piece that Kid 1 gets. So this will solve the problem for both these people. Uh, nobody will envy each other's pieces. And uh, that will solve this problem for the mother, even without knowing what is a fair division. So isn't that a classic mechanism? So that is exactly what mechanism design uh, is all about. We are going to discuss that and uh, quite naturally it is the inverse of the game theory. We started with an objective to do a fair division and we designed the game and uh, this mechanism is essentially that uh, designed game uh, which gave you the desirable or the reasonable outcome, uh, in this case the fair uh, division outcome as the equilibrium and nobody will like to deviate from it. So this is essentially giving you a prescription. So this is why it is called the prescriptive approach mechanism design. Uh, why should we care to design a game in, in, in practice? And there are many uh, uh, such examples. So this is certainly a toy example, but you can extrapolate that example for various other kind of fair division problems. Just imagine uh, the division uh, of uh, some other resources uh, when there are various other kind of uh, influences or constraints. So one uh, example that I'm going to talk about uh, specifically, which uh, really happens in practice, is about sports tournaments. So imagine the cricket tournaments or football tournaments, um, any other kind of uh, sporting tournaments. Uh, typically, uh, uh, those tournaments have um, uh, uh, the, the teams are being partitioned into uh, different groups. And the first round is a round robin uh, where every uh, team in that particular group plays against each other and then finally the top two qualifies to the next round now we, we are going to ask whether this is a really a good tournament design and i'm going to argue that it is not and here is one example let us go back a little bit in fact there are various such examples uh, in the uh, in the recent past uh, in particular uh, the the 2012 london olympics uh, in the badminton tournament a very similar thing had happened you can search for it but let me uh, keep my attention focused on this specific example the world cup football or soccer of 1982 so and this happened in group two so at that point there were various teams and uh, austria was one of the uh, uh, very strong uh, teams at that point um, it was much stronger, uh, presumably on paper, uh, uh, than most of the other teams. And uh, Chile was the weakest team in this group. Uh, there was uh, no doubt that Chile uh, has very little chance to uh, qualify to the next round. Uh, the, the only contest is between Algeria and West Germany, who are kind of uh, quite close to each other. Now, in the first game, uh, uh, some shock happened. I mean, even though West Germany was slightly better than Algeria, Algeria actually beat West Germany in 2-1. This was, this was a shock defeat uh, for West Germany. And that essentially start, started this whole event of how uh, game theory can come in, or mechanism design can come in, uh, into, into this situation. So the, the rest of the games, uh, until the last game, was uh, very uneventful. Uh, Austria beat Algeria, which was uh, which was expected. Algeria also beat Chile, so essentially everybody beat Chile. Um, but uh, what happened was Algeria beat Chile, but by only a goal difference of one, while West Germany beat uh, Chile with a larger goal difference. So in goal difference way, uh, West Germany was uh, uh, ahead of Algeria. Now all uh, that depends is on the last game uh, between West Germany and Austria. So the final game was between um, Austria and uh, West Germany and uh, almost everybody assumed because uh, Austria is a much stronger team, West Germany has no chance to win against it. Uh, so if they draw or even um, if they lose or make a draw, Algeria is going to uh, qualify. But uh, that is where the where the whole game theoretic part started. Um, uh, this uh, 
uh, essentially uh, West Germany and Austria made a uh, made a pact uh, for whatever reason. Uh, they made a contract that they will essentially get uh, will be will be losing. So Austria will be losing to West Germany. Uh, so in the first ten minutes of the game, West Germany was very aggressive and uh, scored one goal. And then in the rest of the game, they uh, both these teams just stopped playing. They did not. Uh, they were doing some uh, passes around, and there were no competition among them. And both the um, uh, uh, spectator account and uh, all the other documents essentially point to the fact that uh, they they decided the the outcome. What happens in that case is because Austria has already qualified, it doesn't really matter for them whether they lose or uh, win at the last game. But for West Germany, because of its win, it gets the points which equals Algeria. But uh, because it has a larger goal difference than Algeria, it actually qualifies. So Algeria gets eliminated, and West Germany and uh, Austria qualifies. So if you want to dig uh, deeper into it, you can uh, search with disgrace of Gijon. Gijon is the place uh, in Spain where this uh, uh, tournament took, took place uh, in uh, 1982 and uh, you can get more information now if we uh, have to say what was the reason uh, it is uh, not about the um, uh, about the players like the the teams in fact fifa's uh, final ruling uh, was that uh, uh, none of these teams have actually broken any rule uh, it was the rule that was uh, 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 that was uh, uh, imperfect the the mechanism in which this uh, tournaments were designed was imperfect and these teams just took advantage of that. So similar things happened, as I mentioned in in, uh, in 2012 in London Olympics. Um, so uh, f f the 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 point here that I am trying to make is that uh, your tournament design should be uh, some sort of truthful in some sense, so that uh, none of these teams have any incentive to do such kind of a uh, malpractice in in the game. Uh, later on, after this incident, FIFA has changed its uh, uh, its tournament design slightly by making the last uh, match uh, of uh, uh, last two matches, uh, which are quite uh, deciding factor um, uh, among these teams simultaneously. Uh, but that also does not completely solve this problem. So uh, you can think of a completely different uh, uh, tournament uh, design as happens in most of the tennis tournaments where it is knockout from the very beginning. But that gives very little chance uh, for any team to, to come back. So for instance, uh, if, uh, if there was a, a just for, uh, due to some, some other reason, they did not perform well in the first game itself, they have no chance to come back in, into the tournament. So there is a kind of a disparity and maybe it's a very interesting mechanism design problem how you can uh, keep uh, both these uh, chances of uh, coming back to the tournament as well as not doing this kind of um, strategic manipulations. So that is what we, uh, we will be discussing in the second part of this course in mechanism design. So the, uh, the, uh, the broad outline of this course is that first we'll be talking about non-cooperative game theory, uh, uh, that is uh, what I meant by game theory. We will not be discussing another uh, uh, aspect of game theory which is cooperative game theory. And in the second part we will be discussing uh, in uh, mechanism design in, in more detail and that is the focus of this course. Uh, the first part is essentially a preparatory phase for the second part. And in the in between, we'll be giving uh, various uh, applications where both this game theory and mechanism design could be useful. So in, at the end, you will be able to apply the principles of economic theory and computation to understand incentives in social systems and that on the internet, and will the test for mathematical description of these social problems. And uh, if you are interested, you can also trans transform this understanding into deployable AI system. Uh, that does all this decision making automatically. So this uh, this course will be mostly self-contained. Uh, we'll uh, share the, uh, uh, the the lecture notes and also these videos will be available. Uh, but if you really want to read some of the books uh, and do problems, uh, there is a game theory book by Mashler, Solan, and Zamir and a multi-agent systems uh, book by Shoham and Leighton Brown and several other references which are also given on the course web page.